I'm Connor Old, and welcome back to another episode of Movie Star Magic. And this week, we're going to be looking at the career of Matthew McConaughey, one of those guys that I've always wanted to look at ever since I started this series, because I think he has a fascinating career and is one of the most alluring and interesting actors working today. But if you're new to the series, what I do every single week is pick an actor and try to figure out what their movie star magic is. What is that one unique thing that makes them an interesting on-screen presence? And essentially how the show works is the first two-thirds of the video, I break down their career into three separate chapters just to make it easier to understand their sort of career arc and career trajectory and how the different projects they've picked has sort of changed in the public eye and our perception of them. And in each of the chapters, I pick a defining role, which helps understand what that chapter is as well as talking about some of their best movies and then finally that final uh, third of the video I try to figure out what makes them unique as an actor what is that special presence that links them throughout all of their movies and why that makes them so great so starting off with things chapter one I'm calling this chapter the young stud because very much early on, Matthew McConaughey had this very quick rise to fame. And I think his sort of good looks and charismatic, charismatic charm sort of added to that sort of young, hip, exciting appeal of, of many directors working with him, but also the audience members going to see his movies. Starting off in an iconic role in his very first movie role in Dazed and Confused, from there, only a couple years later, he gets A Time to Kill, which was a big John Grisham lawyer movie, which was sort of these vehicles for these great young actors. He beat out a lot of big names like a Val Kilmer, like even a Woody Harrelson, to get that part and was sort of the ideal person for that part. He is so great in it and he has very much a leading role in that movie. And then pretty much, you know, he does Days and Confused, he's living out of his own car, he tries acting, it works, gets a time to kill. That's a big movie, big box office hit, um, well appreciated, and, and he's definitely one that immediately sort of pops out and goes, oh, that one guy who had a bit parked and Dazed and Confused, oh, he's really good in this too, he can be a real serious actor. And then what's fascinating is after this, in 96, uh, or 96 was Time to Kill, and then the next year, 97, he does two movies, Contact and Amistad. So he works with the literally the two biggest directors at the time, Robert Zemeckis coming off of Best Picture winner Forrest Gump, and Steven Spielberg coming off Best Picture winner Schindler's List and Jurassic Park that same year. Literally two of the biggest directors in Hollywood at that time are like, that guy, Matthew McConaughey, I want him. And while those movies aren't as successful as the previous ones, uh, they are still sort of uh, uh, good movies within his overall career and show people that he's still you know, an established, well-respected actor. And then works with you know other great directors afterwards like Ron Howard and then reteams with Richard Linklater. But the thing is, all of those movies aren't these massive hits. They aren't game changers. Uh, there are sort of maybe lesser movies within the director's filmography. So there is a little bit of a perceived like, oh, he made the right choices, but he's maybe not totally there as an actor. But in this sort of early young period, when I w when I was thinking about a finding role. I wanted to go with the movie that was the most defining rather than maybe my favorite movie of this period. So I ultimately went with The Time to Kill. And why I think this John Grisham movie holds up a little bit more compared to like a Pelican Brief or The Rainmaker or even something like The Firm is because of Matthew McConaughey's performance and particularly that sort of final monologue, that imagine if she was white monologue is one of those great lawyer movie monologues that's put into the annals of film history sort of immediately. And I think a large part of the success and why I ultimately did enjoy the movie is because of Matthew McConaughey's performance, that oftentimes the movie can feel like a sort of Mad Libs lawyer game. However, McConaughey is so great at grounding that story, even though there's sort of craziness and so many instances and events going on one after another, it's very salacious in that regard. McConaughey and his ability to feel like a sort of empathetic, sympathetic, but still sort of small town lawyer with an ambition. Um, he really does fit the role very perfectly. Intelligent, but calm and collected, but sort of wrestling with that as well. <laughs> because he fits the, the character so well, I think he's able to ground that that the movie and the believability. So you're not just going, oh my God, these insane events, this would never happen in real life. You does feel like a real life, almost a true story. Also, I think it's telling that oftentimes the dialogue is grand and speaking in themes, you know, they're always talking about justice and civil liberty and very rarely talking like regular human beings. But once again, McConaughey in his ability to sort of ground that dialogue, I think makes it feel like more of a real person rather than just like a, a, a 
an embodiment of a theme of an idea of justice and his ability to modulate the sort of anxiousness between the scenes of Samuel L. Jackson to the, some of the more romantic scenes with someone like Cassandra Bullock. He really does uh, modulate quite a bit in this in this movie too. So it's a, a classic sort of young, great leading man role and he is terrific in the movie. Then chapter two, I'm calling this chapter The Lost Child because starting in 2001, he stars in his first romantic comedy and for the next 10 years, that's what he does. He does a total of 13 movies, more than half of them are romantic comedies, at least in my books, you know, how I would classify them. And even more, you could include some of them like uh, that have a sort of romantic sort of a plot if you want to reach back into something like NTV even. But he is very much sort of into this uh, zone of the romantic comedy genre that oftentimes because of his sort of good looks, I think he was almost, the, the way you can compare him to in terms of his career arc would almost be more akin to like a female co-star, uh, a female uh, movie star like a Julia Roberts or his co-star Sandra Bullock in A Time to Kill, or even like a Ben Affleck. He was always interested in like, oh, he's so good looking, who is he dating? So it makes sense why he sort of transferred into a little bit more of the female-centric genre of the romantic comedy. The sort of uh, sad part of it, especially if we've seen what he's doing now, is that a lot of his talent was wasted in those movies. They're very generic, they're very sort of tropey and cheesy. And if you look at a lot of those movies, they have poor reviews. Now, the other sort of disappointing part of this his period of his career is that all of his movies were doing bad. Even, you know, the non-romantic comedy stuff, even the We Are Marshals, even the Two for the Monies, even the Reign of Fire. I and mean, the movies I like, I like Two for the Money, I like Reign of Fire. I even like, you know, a frailty, which he has sort of a more of a bit part in, but he's, he's fantastic in that. You know, if you look at his Metacritic score of those 13 movies in this sort of 10 year period, I'm calling this chapter The Lost Child. He's a lost child because he's got a Metacritic score of 44 averaging throughout all of his movies. His movies are coming out, they're not doing very well at the box office, um, except for the sort of romantic comedies. So he's sort of going back to that, getting paid for that, and it's sort of being trapped in this trope. But even myself, a fan of romantic comedy genre, it's not like he's Tom Hanks. He's not putting Sleepless in Seattle out and You've Got Mail. He's putting out some rough movies. I mean, uh, Fool's Gold and Ghosts of Girlfriends Past. I mean, these are sort of forgettable, non-existent kind of movies in which he's not very good in it and the movie isn't terrific at all. So while he does sort of do some interesting things in this period, he is very much in this kind of uh, a rut of just being pigeonholed into these uh, romantic comedy type movies. But when talking about a defining role in this period, I felt like while I still like a, a Reign of Fire or Two for the Money, I wanted to go for a Tropic Thunder, really. I mean, he's the fifth lead in that movie, but you know, still, you know, it's a movie I enjoy. But still, when we're talking about a defining role for this period, I had to pick one of those romantic comedies because it meant it, it dominated more than half of the movies of this period from about 2001 to 2011. I had to pick something. So I actually went with a movie that I think is the best of, of the bunch and a movie that I do genuinely enjoy, and that's How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Now, is it sort of tropey? Yes. Is it sort of generic? Yes. But is he very charming in it? Yes. And I think it is a total sort of acceptance of that fact. When we look at movies like The Wedding Planner or even Fool's Gold, they're not sort of totally committing to the best parts of Matthew McConaughey, and this movie does so. Number one, um, he's very attractive. This movie makes him look terrific, riding a motorcycle, only wearing suits, smiling constantly. He looks the best he's ever looked in this movie. That's number one. You know, they really sort of allow him to just look in incredible, which is, I think, an appeal of the movie. And then number two, they really allow him to be genuinely funny. I mean, this is a guy, Ed TV, he's funny, Tropic Thunder, um, later on, you know, into the Beach Bum, he's a genuinely funny comedic actor. And I think a lot of the the humor and the comedy of this movie come from a lot of the sort of facial reactions that he has from this crazy girlfriend, uh, Andy, played by Kate Hudson, and some of his sort of abilities to burst out and go crazy, like in that uh, fake therapy scene. Very funny. He's very physical in that regard and um, can do a lot of the sort of uh, interesting and funny kind of reaction shots that the movie cuts to. He's very successful at that. So, you know, a very charming movie. Um, a movie that I do enjoy while it is sort of generic and tropey. It's a great sort of setup anyways um, to sort of keep that plot going and the hijinks humor of it I think he nails quite well. Then chapter three, I'm calling this chapter of course the McConaissance, a coin turned <laughs> online to sort of talk about Matthew McConaughey quickly turning around his career from doing this 10 year period, I mean that's a long time in an actor's career, of these sort of poor movies, these romantic comedies, these f flops like Sahara, um, and really starting to go back to his roots. So in 2011, just three movies, one where he plays a lawyer, Lincoln lawyer, so going back to what he's great at, like in Amistad, like in A Time to Kill, 
then uh, same year works with great directors you know really prior to is that you know does Richard Link a Linklater movie does uh, William Friedkin movie and then really this period from 2011 to 2012 he does a lot of movies that are sort of southern focused I mean look at Paperboy a southern lawyer you know he's predictably terrific in that uh, Mud is another sort of great supporting uh, role and he really stands out in that movie so we're getting a couple of years now where you're going oh wow Matt McConaughey excellent performance oh excellent performance one after another one after another and then 2013 has this really great bit part in The Wolf of Wall Street but the big one was the transformative role in Dallas Buyers Club in which he gets his first nomination and first Academy Award so he gets that Oscar goes up on stage has that sort of smooth charming stuff and we're going yes he's back that sort of gravitas and power that he showed in A Time to Kill in Amistad uh, you know he, he's back he's going to do this he's it's almost looking back on it you're going oh that's just a waste of that sort of 10 year period of those romantic comedies when he could have been giving us movies like this and performances like this and he's terrific in Dallas Buyers Club and then it doesn't stop I mean the next year he's in the TV show an iconic TV show in the first season of True Detective and then the same year he's in the big Christopher Nolan summer blockbuster Interstellar which is another sort of classic film in my opinion and then what he's done sort of from there on hasn't always been of the same level of heights. I think it's been a lot weirder and a lot interesting. Like Gold is a very sort of odd movie. Beach Bum is a very sort of psychedelic, weird, very fun movie. I mean, if you're on that vibe, you really like it. Even something like The Sea of Trees, um, which I don't really totally resonate with, you still have to go, wow, it's an interesting, artistic, kind of a strange choice for him to do. Even Serenity, I mean, what a bold movie that was. So this later period has sort of been a little bit more weirder, so we're gonna see where his career evolves. But I had to talk about the McConaughey's, that quick turnaround, where he does these sort of smaller, great independent movies, no more romantic comedies, starting to do a lot more darker movies, and then wins that Oscar, and then leverages that, and does great things on TV and in film, making iconic role after iconic role. But when talking about the defining role of this period, it was so hard to choose which one, but ultimately I went with Interstellar, and I went for, for a similar little reason, I went with The Time to Kill because there's a scene in Interstellar in which I go, is this the best acting I've ever seen? It's, you know, not to spoil the movie even though it's, it's out and if you haven't seen it, it's a masterpiece. But to, not to spoil the movie, if, if, if you've seen the movie, you know, I'll just say that when he comes back to the spaceship and sees the video recording from his daughter and he's just sitting there and he's just totally exposed and crying and breaking down, it is just a terrific performance. And I think... What's also so great about the movie is that so much of the movie is like the American man in space is kind of how I see it. And his character is the emotional core of the movie. He is the reason why I think the movie either works for you or it doesn't work for you. And he spends a lot of time being that sort of stoic father, being that sort of, uh, well, that, that um, struggling but earnest and, and stoic wise man in this kind of period to help keep his family together in this time of great uh, struggle and he is a heroic figure and he is kind of the glue um, but oftentimes it's the emotional connection of the movie is what happens in the first act rather than his sort of space adventures we'll call them. So I think he's integral to the movie's success, and I think the movie is so terrific in that. So he's incredibly captivating, incredibly stoic, and the emotional core of the movie. And like I said, that one scene, which you may have seen even as a meme on the internet, is really impactful, at least it was for me. And then when coming up with a defining feature for Matthew McConaughey, I ultimately went with the descriptor of the smooth seductor. Because when trying to find a connection between mud and fool's gold it was kind of difficult but then i realized in all of his performances there's a level of seduction now it doesn't always have to be sexual seduction but there's always in a compelling lean in presence that mcconaughey has if you think about a movie like a time to kill and he's giving that monologue always having these sort of intimate scenes with samuel jackson's character in the jail cell there is something where we're always leaning in we're always paying attention he's able to sort of tell us a story and draws in with a sort of seductive spell that he has in that movie in an emotional benefit but even in a small scene like in Ed TV when he's trying to get on the show you really believe that Ellen DeGeneres thinks this guy is incredibly interesting because of his ability to sort of tell a story and sit back everybody I'm going to project up to you and I'm going to sort of uh, bring you in and now in the romantic comedies I do think they're sort of seductive in the more traditional sense in that they're sexy and sexual but then even if we're talking about the later movies like uh, Interstellar, 
where he is very stoic and wise and interesting. And his ability to tell a story and say these complex um, scientific, often uh, sentences in these very sort of traditional and simplistic and easy to understand kind of a ways, he is seductive in his ability to tell that story and to communicate that audience. So there's always something sort of seductive about him in one sense, in a sexual sense because of how good looking he is, but also there is sort of a iconic iconography kind of a way where you just look at his face and you know I heard one description that said uh, he looks like he his profile should be on the side of a coin he does have that sort of a presidential s kind of a, of a face in my opinion of that sort of perfectly sculptured well-respected beloved intelligent kind of a man so he's always sort of seducing the audience but he just the the, the genre changes and the filmmaker uses it in a different way but he's always seducing the audience and how he does that i think is through speed and pitch control that he is an expert at his way of speaking his dialogue he will take things slow he is the master of the pause he will you know like a great comic he'll let things linger you know when I think of you know a time to kill in that scene before he finally says imagine if she was white he like cries and then is holding it back and then choking up and then choking up and then relaxing and and then finally gets it out and clear you know, there is a sort of element of pause and wait and show the emotion on you and the, the building up, the welling up, rather than, you know, like a Nicolas Cage style over the top, it is very much a, a restraint about to come up. I can see it's about to come up, but maybe not always let out kind of a seduction. And because of his sort of ability to pause, his ability to speak slowly with that Southern drawl, it makes things a little bit more interesting, a little bit more storytelling-esque. And always because of his ability to speak slowly and oftentimes quietly, we're always leaning in. We always want to listen more rather than being blown away by say a Nicolas Cage or Al Pacino he is a guy that makes us want to lean in and that's the difference for me and he's so great at using that charm to make us fall in love or to make us doubt or to make us inspired that he can pretty much play any kind of a role and he is I still think one of the most interesting of the ring actors working today and if he has a movie I will even though it may not be good his taste isn't always immaculate he is an actor that always has something interesting uh, going on with him behind the scenes there's always interesting performance going on even in a movie like gold or serenity it's like McConaughey is doing something interesting at the very least he always has he always has that but that's about it guys i hope you enjoyed the video make sure you comment below let me know your favorite matthew mcconaughey movie maybe it's your favorite uh, maybe it's your favorite performances on tv like a, a true detective i'd love to hear that but that's about it guys i hope you enjoy the video and until next time stay tuned